I'm too fast, champion. I'm the king. You know how great I am. I don't have to tell you about my strategy. I tell you, let my trainer tell you. Bodine, come here. Tell him, what are we going to do? You're going to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Oh, ah, that's what we're going to do. You heard it. That's my trainer. He's not only a fighter. I'm a poet, I'm a prophet, I'm the resurrector, I'm the savior of the boxing world. If it wasn't for me, the game would be dead. Muhammad Ali is a man that needs no introduction. He is no ordinary Joe. He was a boxing legend and a man who stood up for what he believed in. Folks called him the greatest and it wasn't just talk. He's considered one of the biggest sports stars of the 20th century and some say he's the best heavyweight boxer of all time. From 1964 to 1970, Ali ruled the Ring Magazine heavyweight title. Between 1974 and 1978, nobody could touch him. He was the undisputed champ, and from 1978 to 1979, he held both the WBA and Ring heavyweight titles. And in 1999, Sports Illustrated named him Sportsman of the Century, and the BBC crowned him the Sports Personality of the Century. Ali wasn't just a fighter, he was a showman. He took on some of the most famous boxers of his time and unlike other boxers who let their managers do all the talking Ali loved the limelight and was known for his cheeky banter he was a master of trash talking often breaking into freestyle rhymes and spoken word poetry making him a forefather of hip-hop when I got to Africa I had one hell of a rumble I had to beat Tarzan's behind first for claiming to be the king in the jungle for this fight I've wrestled with alligators I've tussled with a whale I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail you know I'm bad. You have murdered a rock. I injured a stone and I hospitalized a brick. I'm so bad I make medicine sick. I'm so fast, man. I can run through a hurricane and don't get wet. When George Fulmer meets me, he'll pay his debt. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. He'd even predict which round he'd knock out his opponent. I loved his cockiness the most. When he was trash talking, he was a professional troll and he knew how to get under his opponent's skin. I'll show y'all an example later in the video of how he got under Frazier's skin and was squabbling during a live interview and I definitely see where Layla Ali got her confidence and trash talking skills from because I love that about her also and I did a video breaking her down also which I'll put in the comments pinned and in the end cards so you guys can check out. No one trash talk like they do. People say I'm conceived I talk too much but they must have pity on me. It's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. <laughs> Why is it, do you think, that, that you draw the crowds uh, of all the sportsmen in the world? You are well, mainly, a great crowd drawer. Mainly personality's got a lot to do with it. Uh, uh, personality. Joe Frazier, for an example, he's the champion, they say. Number one, he don't have the personality. He can't talk. Very few boxers can get on this show and match wits with wise men like yourself. Mm. And uh, if you take the camera on close up, you see my nose and my face. I'm not ugly. I'm not ugly like most fighters. They have noses like that and their ears are like that. <laughs> How you feel, champ? <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm a pretty fighter. I knew how to talk to, to um, men like you with less intelligence than myself. And <laughs> no, I was only joking. Listen to them laugh. Very few comedians can do this, and that's their job. So like I'm saying, it's personality that attracts. And all of this up, all I represent, they're my confidence. I am the greatest. I cannot lose. I'm pretty. And every man believes he's the greatest. Every man would like to be the greatest. Many want to say this, but they fear it. And they see this in myself, and some hate me for it, and some love me. So, so add it all up, and we have a large crowd. <laughs> but Ali was more than just a boxer. He was also a spoken word artist, releasing two studio albums, I Am The Greatest and The Adventures of Ali and His Gang versus Mr. Tooth Decay. Both albums were nominated for Grammy Awards. He also tried his hand at acting and writing, releasing two autobiographies. And after hanging up his glove, Ali turned his attention to religion, philanthropy, and activism. There was so much controversy surrounding his life, of course. We are going to get into all of that in more but first hey friend welcome to my channel Karina Lude where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history if you're not yet subscribed please be sure to do so and if you're already subscribed please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload now let's get into this video every legend has an origin story what was Ali's origin story Let's start with his childhood. On January 17, 1942, in a place called Louisville, Kentucky, a boy named Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. was born. He had one little brother. His dad was a guy who painted signs and billboards, and his mom, Odessa, helped out in other people's homes. Even though his dad was a Methodist, he let Odessa raise Cassius and his younger brother, Rudy, as Baptist. Because his name was Cassius during his younger life, we're just going to call him Cassius until he changed. 
changes his name. So Cassius went to Central High School in Louisville. It was hard for him because he had dyslexia, which made reading and writing tough. Growing up, he faced a lot of unfairness because of his skin color. One time, he wasn't even allowed to have a drink of water at a store because of it. That really upset him. One day when he was 12, someone stole his bike. He was so mad, he told a police officer that he was going to beat him up, the thief. But the officer, Martin, said he should learn how to box first. And at first, Cassius didn't want to, but then he saw some amateur boxers on a TV show called Tomorrow's Champions. This got him interested in boxing. How did you come to take up boxing? Well, I started about six years ago. My bicycle was stolen and my cousin was a boxer. He wasn't too successful, but he boxed. You know how kids think. If I ever caught the guy that stole my bicycle, well, he would, uh, I would know how to fight. You know, I could defend myself. Well, uh, anyway, he took me to the gym and he quit later, but I kept it up. So he started training with Fred Stoner, who helped him develop his style, stamina, and system. And after four years, he began working with another trainer named Chuck Bodak. Cassius Jr.'s first boxing match was in 1954 against a guy named Ronnie O'Keefe, and he won. He went on to win a bunch of titles, including six Kentucky Golden Gloves, two National Golden Gloves, an Amateur Athletic Union National title, and the light heavyweight gold medal at the 1960s Summer Olympics in Rome. His record as an amateur boxer was impressive, 100 wins and only 5 losses. So let's get into his professional career. On a chilly day on October 29, 1960, Cassius Clay stepped into the ring for his first pro fight. His opponent, a fella named Tony Hunsacker. Clay showed him what's what and took home a win after six rounds. From that day till the end of 1963, Clay was unstoppable. He won 19 fights straight and 15 of those were knockouts. He faced off against tough guys like Tony Esperti, Jim Robinson, Donnie Fleeman, Alonzo Johnson, George Logan, Lamar Clark, Doug Jones, and Henry. Henry Cooper. And guess what? He beat all of them. Clay didn't just win fights. He won them with flair. He trash talked his opponents, calling Jones an ugly little man and Cooper a bum. He even said Madison Square Garden was too small for me. This wasn't just random bragging though. Clay got the idea from a pro wrestler called Gorgeous George Wagner. After seeing how George Big Talk attracted crowds, Clay decided to try it out on himself. And you were giving him this stare. And he was staring back at you. Was he frightening you or were you frightening him? Well, I don't think neither of us was frightened, but I'm psyching him, so he lets me know he's not scared. But I don't see him or see me. I see people like you watching. And they were looking and building it up to be a race war. I said, I said you don't stand a chance. I'm going to run you out of the ring. And people in Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia, whoop that. He talks too damn much. Hey, let's go see this fight. <laughs> In a 1969 interview, Clay revealed that he met George in Las Vegas back in 1961 and George told him that if you talk big, people will pay to see you, either because they want you to win or because they want to see you lose. So Clay turned himself into a self-described big mouth and a bragger. And guess what? People loved it. Later in 1963, Clay was all set to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the reigning champ, Sonny Liston. The match was scheduled for February 25th, 1969 in the sunny city of Miami Beach. Now Liston was a scary dude, a real bruiser with a rap sheet and rumored mob connections. The odds were stacked against Clay, 7 to 1. But did that bother our man? Not one bit. He called Liston the big ugly bear and he smelled like one too and even promised to donate him to the zoo after the fight. The fight began and Liston charged at Clay looking madder than a wet hand and ready for a quick knockout. But Clay was too fast, too nimble. He danced around Liston, making the champ miss and look clumsy. Ali's first title fight was against Sonny Liston, a formidable champion with a long reach and notably large fists, who'd served time in prison for robbery. Ali dominated, aside from a period during the fourth round when his eyes were aggravated by some unknown substance, the nature of which remains debated to the present day. Ali was now the heavyweight champion of the world. At 22, Clay became the youngest boxer to snatch a title from a reigning heavyweight champ. After the fight, Clay changed his name to Cassius X, then Muhammad Ali. He joined the Nation of Islam, a decision that started a lot of controversy. Ali had a rematch with Liston in May 1965, which ended in more drama. Liston hit the deck in the first round from a punch nobody saw. The ref didn't even start counting right away because Ali wouldn't back off. Liston got up after about 20 seconds, but the ref stopped the match anyway and declared Ali the winner. Now it's 1962 and young Cassius Clay bumps into Malcolm X. This meeting was the start of a deep bond, with Malcolm X becoming Clay's spiritual guide and political guru. When Clay faced off against Liston, members 
of the Nation of Islam, including Malcolm X, were noticeably part of his crew. This stirred up a fuss and led to a story in the Miami Herald revealing that Clay had joined the Nation of Islam. This bombshell almost got the fight called off. Clay's dad spilled the beans saying his son had joined the black Muslims when he was just 18. But here's the twist. At first, the Nation of Islam didn't even want Clay because of his boxing career. However, when he snatched a championship from Liston in 1964, they changed their tune and proudly announced his membership. Not long after, on March 6, Elijah Muhammad, the leader of Nation of Islam, gave a radio address announcing that Clay would now be known as Muhammad Ali. Ali wasn't shy about his new name, declaring his old one a slave name and a white man's name. He said, I am Muhammad Ali, a free man, a name that stood for praise and being the most high. Ali wasn't afraid to ruffle feathers. He said, I am America. I am the part you won't recognize, but get used to me. Black, confident, cocky, my name, not yours. My religion, not yours. My goals, my own, get used to me, end quote. But things got rocky when Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam just a few weeks after Ali joined. Ali decided to stick with the Nation of Islam and turn his back against Malcolm X, a decision he later said was one of his biggest regrets. With the Nation of Islam labeling white folks as the bad guys and being seen as a hate religion, Ali found himself in the crosshairs of public criticism. How was it, Muhammad, anyway, to be a, a, a Negro boy in the South? You uh, say black now. All right, black. All right. About you. All right. Is it not the same thing? What? No, Negro. We are taught that all people are named after country. Chinese are named after China. Cubans are named after Cuba. But, but there's no country named Negro. Mm. <laughs> all right, then let me. You understand? I understand. You're let me not as dumb let, as you look. Let me rephrase. <laughs> what attracted you then to Islam in the first instance? You no, know, Muslim religion. Yes. It's the true teachings of Elijah Muhammad. The history of ourselves. The history of our true religion. Our nationality. Our names. See, we don't have our names. See, Chinese have names like Chang Chong, Lu Chen, this is Islamic teachings. Russians have names like Kosygin or Khrushchev. And Jews got names like Weinstein and Goldberg. And, and Italians got names like Dundee and Benvenuti and Marciano. <laughs> but we have names like Grady and Clay and Hawkins and Smith and Jones and Johnson. But we are black. These so, are the slave names. Yeah, this so is the, this when is I heard this, I knew it was the truth. It's history. So Muhammad Ali is a beautiful black name name of our ancestors. Then they told me how we were brainwashed in America. We see Jesus, he's white with blonde hair and blue eyes. We see the angels in heaven, all white people. And we look at Miss Universe, a white woman. Miss America, a white woman. Miss World, a white woman. Even Tarzan, the king of the jungles in Africa, he was white. He's like, oh, 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 oh. We see a white man swinging around Africa. Oh, 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 oh. What a diaper! So I'm just showing you how the black man in America has been whitewashed his mind. And then we look at the good cowboys, they rode the white horses, and the president lived in the White House, and, and the angel food cake was the white cake, but the devil food cake was the chocolate cake. <laughs> Everything good was white. So our religion teaches us the knowledge of ourselves, the knowledge of our culture, the knowledge of our history. It makes us want to be with our own, marry our own, live with our own, clean up ourselves, do for self, quit forcing ourselves in white neighborhoods. And after I heard this, being an intelligent man, then like I'm not only a winner in boxing or my stand on the draft. This leader is Elijah Muhammad, who we believe was taught by Allah, God himself, to teach the so-called American Negroes the truth that's been hidden from them for 400 years, which will free them. Why is it, do you think, that, that black Muslims preach the separation of the races rather than integration of the races? When we say separate, we mean mainly mentally, as far as do for yourself, help self, clean your own neighbors and make them better, a better place to live, and quit force yourself in the white neighbors because they're cleaner. Respect your women, a pool of resources, education and qualifications for self-independence. People are just tired and they're revolutionizing things and they want to be free. We've been in America under white domination, lynch, kill, rape straight is shot down daily no justice in the courts the pride of freedom justice and equality and we just now want to be free i can write a disagreeable in peace they can't get along together so we think we should just now quit fighting quit being violent now that we're doctors now that we're lawyers now that we're mechanics now that we're educated we think that we should now go on some land and build and construct and do for ourselves people are not always begging white people for houses begging for jobs begging for seat in your restaurant may i use your toilet may i ride on your bus now that i'm grown and educated now we're no longer slaves and we can't get along just let me go and live by myself like like other people ain't nothing wrong with that my mind's too big for that you know i don't want to be where nobody don't want me i believe i'm the greatest well, what i want to be with somebody that's less than me i'm the greatest elijah muhammad has said something which perhaps a lot of us white people have misunderstood he said that white men are devils yes but what though, does he mean by that? he means just what he said though he says the american devils the lynching, the killing, cutting the black people's private out, sticking it in the mouth, is what they did to us. Taking black women who were four months pregnant, they took us for years, and hung us up with the feet, and stuck a dag in the stomach, and ripped it, and pulled the unborn baby out just to put fear in other slaves. They tied up black people to horses, and two horses, and 
pull his arms out and pull his legs out, and this is worse than the devil. The, All right, but I, see, the devil, the preacher in the church taught us that the devil was up under the ground. Right. And he'll wait till he died before he burn us up. This white devil in America was worse because he burned us while we was alive. He didn't wait till we die. <laughs> yes, if Elijah Muhammad can stand in America for 42 years before my little black self was born and say that the American white man is the devil, then the white man should get up and say you are a lie and carry him to court and say we are not the devil. Not one American, not one government official, none of them will stand up and say that they are not devils and this man is lying. Do you believe that every white man is a devil? I mean, Angelo Dundee, Harold Connor? Angelo Dundee's Italian. <laughs> He's got a lot of black blood in him. Harold, Harold, Conrad's, Harold Conrad's Jew. <laughs> you must remember, you have not lynched me. It wasn't the uh, 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 Germans that did this to us. It wasn't the white Canadians who's right on our border. He put emphasis on the American devils. So we have white people, I mean right. I have a black husband. Oh, my children are black. I love everybody. I really believe you. But I'm sorry, man, there's 10 more thousand behind you that don't feel that way. I'm just sorry, but what am I gonna do? Uh, let's say here's 10,000 rattlesnakes coming to bite me. And in those 10,000, there was 1,000 that didn't mean no harm. Now, what should I do? Should I keep the door open and let the 10,000 in, hoping that the 1,000 will unite and save me and one bite will kill me? Or should I just be safe and shut the door? Like, See, when America dropped bombs on Vietnam, she drops them. Okay. Babies, boys, when she dropped a bomb on Japan, she dropped it. They don't say some innocent, they just said war. So when a person in Belfast leave a bomb, they don't say, well, there's a kid, is innocent in here. There's an old lady, she's blind. They just boom, throw the bombs. On a chilly November night in 1965, Muhammad Ali, the reigning heavyweight champion, was all set to defend his title against Floyd Patterson, a former champ himself. But this wasn't just any old fight. You see, Patterson had a habit of calling Ali by his old name, Cassius Clay. And Ali wasn't too pleased about that. That's the one way to get under his skin. So Ali started calling Patterson the rabbit, saying he was scared and acting like an Uncle Tom. The press ate it up. Some folks even said Ali and Patterson were playing it up to sell more tickets and get more people to watch the fight on closed circuit TV. When fight night finally rolled around, Ali dominated Patterson. He was faster, stronger, and just playing better. Poor Patterson looked like he was hurt pretty bad, but he didn't give up. He hung in there for 12 whole rounds before the ref finally called it a technical knockout. But here's the thing, after the fight, some sports writers said Ali was toying with Patterson. They said he could have knocked Patterson out anytime he wanted, but he was just messing with him. Ali didn't like that one bit. He told Howard Hazel in an interview that he didn't knock Patterson out because he could tell Patterson was hurt. He even said Patterson told him later that he'd never been hit by punches as soft as Ali's. But wait, there's more. In 1972, Ali and Patterson had a rematch. Now, by this time, Patterson was having money troubles. He owed a bunch of cash to the IRS, so according to W.K. Stratton, who wrote a book about Patterson, Ali set up the second fight to help Patterson pay off his debt. They were known amongst the boxing community to help out each other. It's kind of like wrestling, where a lot of the beef is fake, it's just business, and they're helping each other make money, trash talking. So behind the scenes, they really did have each other's back. Although sometimes the beef can get real, it wasn't always the case for Ali and a lot of his opponents. It was really about business and making the most money, you know? Now, let's talk about his fight with Terrell. On a cold evening in Houston, February 6, 1967, the stage was set for Ali to square off against Ernie Terrell. Terrell was no pushover. He hadn't tasted defeat in five years and had sent many of Ali's past opponents packing. He was a mountain of a man, bigger and stronger than Ali, with arms that seemed to stretch on forever. Everyone was saying he'd be Ali's toughest challenge since Liston, but what really got under Ali's skin was Terrell refusing to call him by his new name. Over and over, he called him Clay. It drove Ali nuts, and this time, it wasn't fake fake, this was real beef. They even almost came to blows during a pre-fight interview with Howard Cosell because of it. Cassius Clay, yes. Why do you want to say Cassius Clay when Howard yes. Cosell and everybody is calling him Muhammad Ali? Now why you gotta be the one of all people who's color to keep saying Cassius Clay? Uh... Howard Carcel is not the one who's going to fight you. I am. You uh, it really you... hard on yourself now. Why don't you call me my name, man? Well, what's your name? You told me your name was Cassius Clay a few years ago. I never told you my name was Cassius Clay. Uh, my name is Muhammad Ali, and you will announce it right there in the ring after the fight if you don't do it now. For the benefit of this broadcast, him. Acting just like an old Uncle Tom. I'm going to punish you. Let me tell you something, man. You ain't got no business calling me no. Don't call me no Uncle Tom. That's man. what you are, uh, Uncle Tom. Why are you gonna call me Uncle Tom? I ain't gonna, you heard me? me no Just Uncle back Tom. off of me. And so, ladies and Uncle gentlemen. Uncle Tom? Back off of me, man. Back off of me, man. Uncle Tom. 
Ali was so mad, he vowed to make Terrell pay in the ring, and he meant it. I want to torture him, Ali declared. A clean knockout is too good for him. The bell rang, and the fight was on. It was a close match for the first six rounds, but then, in the seventh, Ali turned up the heat. He bloodied Terrell, nearly knocking him out. In the eighth round, Ali started taunting Terrell mid-punch, shouting, What's my name, Uncle Tom? What's my name? From the eighth round onwards, Terrell was virtually helpless. Lee taunted him mercilessly. Time and again he shouted, what's my name, to Terrell. I didn't like it naturally. I didn't like the name call and stuff then, because it was ugly. It was a cruel alley. And we tend to sweep that under the rug. But there was a cruel alley in there. And that was a little disturbing. Civilized sport, barbaric though it is, it's legalized assault. There's got to be some niceties to it. And this wasn't nice. Many believe that the one-sided fight should have been stopped after the ninth round, and the vicious beating went on for the full 15 rounds. I was with the fight. It was controversy. It had a whole lot of, lot of stuff in it that shouldn't be in with hit fights. When it's a fight, all you want to see is, well, one guy win the fight. But uh, he put a lot of, uh, all kind of uh, stuff in it that just didn't belong in there. Ali later claimed that in a clinch towards the end of the fight, Terrell called him by his proper name. Ali won on a unanimous points decision, but received widespread criticism for his actions that night. The fight went the full 15 rounds, but at the end, Ali was the clear winner. After the fight, Terrell claimed Ali had fought dirty. He said Ali had thumbed him in the eye early on, leaving him half blind, and then rubbed his injured eye against the ropes. And those ropes are very painful, okay? They burn. The fight was labeled by critics as one of the ugliest boxing fights. One writer, Tex Maul, wrote, It was a wonderful demonstration of boxing skill and a barbarous display of cruelty. End quote. Ali brushed off the accusations, but for many, the fight only served to confirm their view of him as arrogant and cruel. But he definitely kept his word and he made him pay. So this was one of the instances where it wasn't play play, this was real real. Now let's talk about his draft resistance. In the thick of the Vietnam War, Ali found himself in the crosshairs of Uncle Sam. The draft was calling his name, but Ali wasn't about to answer. He told anyone who listened that he wouldn't serve. That war was against his faith. He said, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. He wondered out loud why he should go halfway around the world to fight when folks back home in Louisville were being treated like dogs. He said, my enemy is the white people, not Viet Cong or Chinese or Japanese. You, my opposer, when I want freedom. You, my opposer, when I want justice. You, my opposer, when I want equality. You won't even stand up for me in America for my religious beliefs and you want me to go somewhere and fight, but you won't even stand up for me here at home." End quote. He also said that a lot of the black people that went to war would come back and wouldn't even be allowed a burger inside of a restaurant. It was just ridiculous. In our prayers, we say my prayers, my sacrifices, my life, and my death are all for Allah. And if I thought that going to war would be instrumental in helping, if I thought going to war would help my people receive their freedom, justice, and equality, you wouldn't have to draft me. I'll go tomorrow. Yeah. No people gain freedom until some have to die, some lose the wealth, some give up money. The white race, when your people first got here, they didn't have these cameras and televisions and jet airplanes and air conditions and Howard Johnson's and Holiday Inns and Americana and Hilton hotels. They had to fight the Indians, watch their daughters and scabbed. Took six months to go from here to Los Angeles. Now you can do it in three and a half hours. But nevertheless, they kept fighting and cutting down the trees. And they didn't see this, but they made a way for the present whites to rule. But whenever people want to really make progress, some have to sacrifice a lot. White America right now is spending $30 million a day in Asia. Black and white boys are dying unjustly for nothing just to free somebody else. So why should I worry about going to little old jail to free my poor people who's been catching hell here for 400 years? <laughs> Are you black, asking me kinda, for an answer to that? It's kind of hard to put a black man or uh, any black person in this country in jail because if you ask the average one, we're already in jail. You know, we've been here in jail 400 years. How, how does the, the subject I've change gotten, so many I've, times I've in that long sentence big, that I really, I'm going to talk for a second now, um, <laughs> that I really don't know how that connects with uh, Howard Johnson's and everything, but uh, uh, do you feel bitter toward the entire white race? Do you think there's something about whiteness that is uh, evil? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, whatever white people do, 
as far as evil or as far as uh, mistreatment, it's just the nature of the uh, white race to be this way if we check history. I watch television, if there's not a movie of white people shooting white people in shootouts and cowboy pictures, they're shooting Indians. If they're not shooting Indians, they're shooting Negroes. If they're not doing that, they're shooting reindeers or elephants or killing something. Just got to shoot. The system is built on war. This is part of the, uh, of the Muslim point, I assume, that, that there's something intrinsically I'm just about history. aggressive well, I'm, about white nature that there I'm isn't about, about black. no religious point. What I'm telling you is in history books, in your own books about this. I have a book called 100 oh, Years sure, of I know. Oh, oh, so I'm not bringing up religion or nothing. This is just the fact that the world knows. You know, just the nature, from what I see of darker people, is peace. I say, like, the Japanese uh, seem to be a peaceful people until somebody else came over uh, dictating and trying to rule them. The Hawaiians, uh, they'd be on the beach doing their little dance. The Indian was building his pier, whatever you call it. The African was somewhere doing his little dance. These people have never tried to go to other planets or slay and slave other people or take over countries. Really? I know that there have well, been outrageous injustices about, against the black people I'm in this country, about, but I'm, it doesn't really get us very far to talk about something as if the white man were some sort of uh, intrinsic devil. The thing that you all have done to us is worse than the devil you told us about underground. How would you like it if I were to lead into a commercial now? Mm, whatever you want to say, but when you say After devil, this message right. from our local stations, will return. Well, you can imagine how that went down with the powers that be. They were as mad as hornet. You expect to go to the military service or will you instead take jail? Well, I'm not saying which one I'll take here. All I will say is that uh, no matter what the outcome will be, I'm sure uh, if this thing do go through, this is my last fight. He's a convicted felon in the United States. He has broken its laws. He has been found guilty. I feel sorry for him because he's a simplistic fool and a pawn. He will inevitably go to prison, as well he should. He is not funny. He's a disgrace to his country. Race. And on April 28, 1967, Ali was supposed to show up in Houston to be drafted into the U.S. Armed Forces, but when they called his name, Ali didn't budge. They warned him he could go to prison for five years and get slapped with a $10,000 fine, but Ali stood his ground. They arrested him on the spot. That same day, the New York State Athletic Commission suspended his boxing license and the World Boxing Association stripped him of his title. Other boxing commissions followed suit. For over three years, Ali couldn't get a license to box in any state. But Ali wasn't alone. Some big name African American athletes like Jim Brown, Bill Russell, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar got together at what's now known as the Cleveland Summit. They wanted to find out if Ali was for real or just blowing smoke. In the end, they decided to stand by him. On June 20th, 1967, it took a jury just 21 minutes to find Ali guilty of refusing to be drafted. The U.S. Supreme Court finally reviewed the case in 1971. While all of this was going on, Ali became a popular speaker at colleges and universities. He gave speeches like his Black is Best talk to thousands of cheering students. It was something no other prize fighter or boxer or athlete has ever done. Finally, on June 28, 1971, the Supreme Court overturned Ali's conviction. His impact on a draft refusal was huge. When Ali stood up and said no to the draft, he rattled a lot of cages. Overnight, he went from being a national treasure to the most hated man in America. Death threats started pouring in, not just for him, but for anyone who dared to stand by his side. But Ali's stand did something else too. It made people think about what it really meant to be great. As New York Times columnist William Roden put it, Ali's actions changed my standard of what constituted an athlete's greatness. It wasn't enough to have a killer jump shot or the ability to stop on a dime. What were you doing for the liberation of your people? What were you doing to help your country live up to the covenant of its founding principles?" End quote. NBA legend Kareem Abdul-Jabbar remembers how Ali's anti-war stance rubbed some folks the wrong way. Teachers at his high school thought Ali was dangerous because he didn't play by the rules. But Abdul-Jabbar saw things differently. He admired Ali for standing tall and being proud of who he was. And he said standing next to Ali made him stand a little bit taller and it made black people feel a little bit more proud to be black. Ali's decision had a ripple effect. It gave a boost to the civil rights movement and inspired a new generation of leaders leaders that were fierce and cocky about it too. Reverend Al Sharpton once said, for the heavyweight champion of the world to risk everything for a cause, that gave legitimacy to the movement like nothing else could." End quote. In 1970, Ali was honored with the annual Martin Luther King Award, but Ali's stand came at a high price. He lost three years in the prime of his career. His trainer, Angelo Dundee, once said he was robbed of his best 
years, his prime years. Let's talk about the NSA and FBI monitoring his communications. It's the height of the Vietnam War and deep in the shadows, a secret operation is taking place, codenamed Minare. This hush-hush mission was orchestrated by the National Security Agency, which is the NSA, and their target, some of America's leading figures who had dared to criticize the war in Vietnam. Among those in the NSA's crosshairs were big names like Muhammad Ali, Senators Frank Church and Howard Baker, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and a host of prominent U.S. journalists. Using their high-tech gizmos, the NSA intercepted the communications, listening in on their most private conversations, and when the NSA later looked back on Operation Minaret, even they had to admit that it was disreputable, if not outright illegal. Fast forward to 1971, the whole world was buzzing about Ali's upcoming fight of the century against Joe Frazier, but a group of activists known as the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI saw an opportunity. They figured with everyone glued to their TVs, watching the fight, security at the local FBI office in Pennsylvania would be relaxed. So while Ali and Frazier duked it out in the ring, the activists pulled off a daring burglary. What they discovered blew the lid off COINTELPRO, a covert operation that involved illegal spying on civil rights and anti-war activists. And guess who was on their target list at the very top? That's right, Muhammad Ali. The extent of the spying was staggering. The FBI had even got their hands on Ali's elementary school records. Among the revelations was a touching detail. Young Ali had a love for art. Who knew? The heavyweight champ had a soft spot for painting and drawing. This was just a lot, right? Leave a fire emoji in the comments for Muhammad Ali because this was a lot, okay? He went through a lot just by standing up for what he believed in. If you watch this far, Make sure you thumbs up the video to push it in the algorithm and leave a fire emoji in the comments, okay? Now let's get into some more fights. Let's talk about his fight with Joe Frazier. The year was 1971 and the boxing world was on fire. Ali and Frazier were about to go head to head at the garden in a fight so epic it was dubbed the fight of the century. The two heavyweights both undefeated, both claiming the champion's belt, it was a showdown for the ages. But let's remember this is Ali coming back after three years of not being able to fight. Okay, And so it was not the same. He was getting his feet wet again. I just want to say this in defense of Ali. <laughs> Word spread like wildfire and before you knew it, the fight was being broadcasted to 36 countries with a whopping 760 press passes handed out. So that's how big it was. But what really got people talking was the pre-fight drama. So Frazier, trying to get under Ali's skin, kept calling him Cassius Clay. And y'all know how he don't like that. This riled up Ali, something fierce. He snapped back, branding Frazier a dumb tool of the white establishment and an Uncle Tom. He even took jabs at Frazier's looks and intelligence, saying he was too ugly and too dumb to be a champ. When the big night finally arrived, it was every bit as thrilling as promising. All the trash talking. Ugh, it was finally the day. Frazier was all over Ali, landing blow after blow. But Ali was no pushover. He took the hits and kept coming back for more. In the end though, it was Frazier who came out on top, handing Ali his first professional defeat. I predict that when I meet Joe Frazier, this will be like a good amateur fighting a real professional. This will be no contest. Not time, not time. This, this will you, be no look, contest. Look, look, you're not fighting Sonny Listen, you fighting Joe Frazier. Well, everybody know this. That's, that's not the point. That's the point. Y'all, what's your prediction? My predict the fight wouldn't go to distance. Oh, no, I'll no, stop it. This is Ali's dramatic comeback. The question now is, does Ali have anything left? Ali also comes in two stages. There's Ali before 1967 when they took his license away, and there's Ali after 1970 when he came back. And when he came back, he was never as fast, he was never as fleet of foot. His return fight, he just didn't look right. It's almost like difficult to watch sometimes. So when you're watching it and you see it, you're reminded of the pure brutality, the, just the flood of punches. But Ali wasn't about to throw in the towel. He went on to win six fights in 1972, including a second bout with Floyd Patterson and a face-off with Bob Foster. The following year, Ken Norton broke Ali's jaw and handed him his second loss. But Ali wasn't done yet. 
He came back to beat Norton in a rematch and set up a second showdown with Frazier at Madison Square Garden in 1974. Ali was the underdog, a former champ past his prime, but he had fire in his eyes and a point to prove. In the early rounds, Ali showed the world why he was considered one of the greatest boxers of all time. He came out swinging, landing blow after blow that left Frazier reeling. At one point, Ali had Frazier on the ropes, only for the ref to step in thinking he'd heard the bell. This gave Frazier a chance to catch his breath and come back fighting. But Ali wasn't going down without a fight. He danced around Frazier, staying just out of reach of his dangerous left hook. And after an intense bout, the judge awarded Ali the victory, setting the stage for a title fight against the reigning heavyweight champion, George Foreman. Foreman was a force to be reckoned with, a brutal puncher who had knocked out both Joe Frazier and Ken Norton in just two rounds. Few thought Ali stood a chance, but Ali wasn't one to back down from a challenge. Ahead of the fight, Ali was as colorful as ever. He boasted to interviewer David Frost, if you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I whoop Foreman's behind. <laughs> the people of Zaire, where the fight was held, loved him. They would chant Ali Bomaye, which meant Ali kill him wherever he went. The fight started with Ali on the offensive, lending right crosses to Foreman's head. But then Ali did something unexpected. He retreated to the ropes and let Foreman hit him, all while taunting him. As Foreman tired himself out, Ali started landing more punches. The crowd went wild. And in the eighth round, Ali knocked Foreman down with a powerful combination. Foreman couldn't beat the count. And just like that, Ali had regained his title. The fight was a sensation, watched by an estimated 1 billion viewers worldwide. It made Ali a hero all over again and cemented his status as one of the greatest boxers of all time. Reflecting on the fight, George Foreman said, I thought Ali was just one more knockout victim until about the seventh round. I hit him hard to the jaw and he held me and whispered in my ear, that's all you got, George? I realized that this ain't what I thought it was, end quote. Never thought that Mike Tyson was the scariest in his prime, the scariest fighter, the person that I thought about was George Foreman. But I had beaten everybody that Muhammad Ali had lost to. George Foreman is not as good of a fighter scientific as I am, but I admit he's stronger and he hit harder. I'm not a hard puncher. I'm not known for being a hard puncher. But I'll tell you this, boxing ability, speed, whooping him on points for the distance if necessary, then I'll whoop him. Maybe he can pull off a miracle. But against George Foreman, so young, so strong, so fearless, against George Foreman, who does away with his opponents one after another in less than three rounds, it's hard for me to conjure with that. The time may have come to say goodbye to Muhammad Ali, because very honestly, I don't think he can beat George Foreman. If you think I whoop Sonny Lister, you wait till I get George Foreman. He talks too much, he's ugly, he's pretending I'm the true champion, and they make me the underdog. I'm going to show them all their own because I'm the champion. I'm the real champion. There'll never be one like me. I'm going to prove to you I'm the greatest. We're going to prove to the world I'm the greatest. This is my last fight. I don't want none of you to miss it. So please, come to the theater. I'm going to eat some raw meat, and I'm going to train. I'm going to get ready and chop some little trees. Oh. Ali, Bumaye, Ali, Bumaye, Ali, Bumaye, Ali, Bumaye. That mean kill it. Been chopping trees. I done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. Bad dude. Awesome power of George Foreman against the violent boxing skills of Muhammad Ali. George Foreman has that serious hook. Ali definitely talking to him. Look at the stare on George Foreman. Look at Ali giving the work. The only thing is he didn't knock Foreman down and he didn't knock him out. Instead, Foreman went crazy. That once did no damage, that one did. Two wild white hands. You know, it's not over till it's over. I don't care how hard you punch, how great a punch is. It's hard to beat somebody that doesn't want to quit. Into the ring with the guy, I bluffed him, I done everything. Beat him up, <laughs> basically for about five or six rounds. I thought it was easy. Then about the sixth round, he whispered in my ear after I hit him in the side. Then all you got, George? Suddenly, Muhammad Ali came off the ropes and he hit him a right. I'm gonna show you how great I am. Muhammad Ali has won, Muhammad Ali has won by a knockdown, by a knockdown. The thing they said was impossible. Nah, 
This fight, this next fight, which was the fight that made him consider retiring, was against none other than Joe Frazier again. This was that third fight. And I believe Joe Frazier was his favorite person to fight because at the end of the day, he said, if Allah ever had, if there was ever a spiritual war, like, you know, in the physical realm, he would want Joe Frazier next to him. I think that was his favorite person to fight. As much as they got into fights, which I'm about to show you, which is crazy because they talk so much junk about each other that they even would get physical on in interviews. Let me show y'all a clip. I heard I was gonna be on a TV with this attorney instead of dressed like a lawyer. Oh yeah, well I thought it was a sports thing. I would come relaxing. I think that uh, you look good, relaxing Joe. Thing, you, know. you don't explain why you dress like you are. Well, that's good. You know, I'm. I decided to put Holly on the left, Frazier in the middle, and Howard on the right. We usually do it with me separating the two interviewees. And I said, Howard, I think I'm gonna get more out of it by the two of them sitting together. First five or six rounds, Ollie was taunting Joe as they were narrating the fight. All you people watching this show, look at Joe Frazier's head now. Then as it wore on, Joe was becoming a little bit more frustrated with it. And at one point, Joe said to Ali, you went to the hospital. That's when you went to the hospital, now. I went to the hospital for 10 minutes. You went for a month, man, be quiet. Joe stood up, ripped off his microphone, and said, what do you mean I'm ignorant? <laughs> Sit down, Joe. Yeah. Why you think I'm eating? Sit down, Joe. Huh? Sit down quick. Why you think I'm eating? Sit the brothers are here. You this too? No. Sit yeah. down yeah. quick, Joe. <clears throat> Joe Frazier is really angry. Muhammad called him ignorant and he's really angry. I don't think this one is clowning at all. A lot of people felt that it was put on, that it was put on because their fight was only a few days away and would create some hype. Anybody in the studio that day wouldn't believe that. They were serious. They were very serious in, in going at it, especially Joe. Our stage hands and others were trying to separate Ali and Frazier. Ultimately, when they got him separated, Joe got up, bolted out of the studio. And that was the last time we saw him for the day. Joe Frazier is leaving the studio now and he is deeply upset. Yeah, this is just them talking junk, but he loved him some Joe Frazier. So this was leading up to that third fight, an interview they were doing up to the third fight where now it was time to talk trash. So picture this, it's October 1st, 1975, and the air is thick with anticipation, okay? Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier are about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a boxing ring in Manila, their third and final showdown. The fight already hyped up as a thriller in Manila is set under weltering heat, closing to a sizzle 100 degree Fahrenheit. From the get-go, Ali was like a man possessed, dancing around the ring and trading punches with Frazier, but soon the heat and Frazier's relentless attack started to take their toll. Ali shifted gears, switching to his famous rope-a-dope strategy, he would lean on the ropes and let Frazier pummel him, only to sneak in a quick counterpunch when Frazier least expected it. By the 12th round, Frazier was starting to get tired. Seizing his chance, Ali landed a series of sharp blows that closed Frazier's left eye and opened a cut above his right. With Frazier's vision compromised, Ali took control of the match. He dominated the next two rounds, and at times it looked like he was using Frazier's head for target practice. It was Ugh, brutal to watch, okay? Very violent. But then just before the 15th and final round, Frazier's trainer, Eddie Futch, threw in a towel. Frazier was desperate to keep fighting, but Futch wouldn't hear of it. Both of Frazier's eyes were swollen shut. He could barely see. Over in Ali's corner, Ali was slumped on his stool. He was exhausted. He'd won the fight, but it felt like he'd been through a war. Later, a weary Ali would say that the fight was the closest thing to dying that I know, end quote. When asked if he'd watch a replay of the fight, Ali reportedly replied, why would I want to go back and see hell, end quote. In a surprising twist, Ali even praised Frazier after the fight, calling him the greatest fighter of all time next to me, end quote. <laughs> So he loved him some Frazier, okay? The brutal bout had taken its toll on Ali. He was considering hanging up his gloves for good. I'm so all over, my arms, my face, my sides all ache. I'm so, so tired, he confessed. There is a great possibility that I will retire. You might have seen the last of me. I want to sit back and count my money, live in my house, in my farm, work for my people, and concentrate on my family, end quote. But he, of course, went on to fight several more times while winning most. He began to lose his last few fights due to early stage of Parkinson's disease. His athletic doctor tried to warn him and tell him to retire because his kidneys were starting to fail him, but Ali did not want to quit, which led to the doctor quitting as his personal doctor. I mean, he was getting blood clots on his legs, and he was getting injured pretty badly, and it was starting to take its toll on him, which is the dark side of MMA, boxing, wrestling, is just to take a toll on the body, right? He would enter the ring with his hands trembling from tremors and his punches a little slower than usual, but still, he would not quit until his body eventually had to quit on him. 
But before we get into his body quitting on him, let's jump into his relationships real quick. Ali's love life was as colorful as his boxing career. The champ tied the knot four times and had a whopping nine kids seven girls and two boys the first lucky lady to catch ali's eyes was sanji roy a cocktail waitress he met through his soon-to-be manager herbert muhammad ali was so smitten that he popped the question on their very first date they rushed to the altar just a month later or but sanji wasn't keen on joining the nation of islam which caused quite a few roles according to ali she wouldn't do what she was supposed to do she wore lipstick she went into bars she dressed in clothes that were revealing and didn't look right End quote. They didn't have any kids and by January 1966, they called it quits. Ali's parting words to Sanji were, you traded heaven for hell, baby. His brother even said that Sanji was Ali's one true love and he never really got over her. Not long after his divorce, Ali found love again with Belinda Boyd. They got hitched in August 1967 and Belinda was a devout member of the Nation of Islam and she changed her name to Khalila Ali. Together they had four kids, but Ali couldn't stay faithful. In 1974, he started seeing 16-year-old Wanda Bolton, who later changed her name to Aisha Ali. He was 32 and she was 16, but I couldn't find any pictures of Aisha. Within the religion also, it was not seen as a big deal because part of the reason why, and I'll do a Malcolm X video in the near future, I got you guys, but part of the reason Malcolm X even left the Nation of Islam was because of this practice with the Honorable you know that was alleged part of the reason why and who knows Muhammad apparently was doing this there's books written on this but it's all alleged next Ali set his sights on actress and model Veronica Porsche they had a daughter Hannah their second daughter Layla Ali which I did a video for was born in December 1977 but once again Ali's wandering eyes led to another divorce in 1986 Ali's final marriage was to Yolanda Lonnie Williams she became Ali's main caregiver in 1982 and he paid for her to go to grad school at UCLA they tied the knot in November 1986 and adopted a son Assad Amin by the end of his boxing career Ali had absorbed an estimated 200,000 hits. In 1984 Ali was diagnosed with Parkinson's syndrome which sometimes results from head trauma from violent physical activities such as boxing and it makes you tremor like you know your hands shake you your speaking kind of changes. Ali was hospitalized in Scottsdale Arizona on June 2nd 2016 with a respiratory illness. Though his condition was initially described as fair it worsened and he unfortunately died the following day at the age of 74 from septic shock. One of his later quotes was, God gave me Parkinson's disease to show me that he was the greatest, not me, end quote. Following Ali's death, he was the number one trending topic on Twitter for over 12 hours and on Facebook for several days. He was mourned globally and a family spokesman said the family certainly believes that Muhammad was a citizen of the world and they know that the world grieves with him. Ali's funeral had been pre-planned by himself and others for several years prior to his actual death. He is the only boxer to be named the Ring Magazine Fighter of the Year six times. Muhammad Ali was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in its first year and held wins over seven other Hall of Fame inductees during an era that has been called the Golden Age of Heavyweight Boxing. The Associated Press ranked him as the second best boxer and best heavyweight of the 20th century. So comment below your thoughts. I though I love Muhammad Ali. I love Muhammad Ali, okay? Though I love Muhammad, I'm not the proudest of his love life, his personal life, you know, even in the Leila Ali video, some of the things he did, you know, she kind of had to speak her truth, which was her truth on her situation with her father, if you're interested in reading that. But I, this is one of the instances where I'm like, you know, we appreciate the sportsmanship of it all. I'm not a huge fan of his personal life. He couldn't keep it faithful. He had an addiction <laughs> to being intimate with people. According to his ex-wife, he could not keep his, you know, in his pants, but women were falling all over him. He didn't have to try at all. You know, he's Muhammad Ali. I mean, he is handsome. Okay. He is a handsome, handsome man all throughout his life. He, he just was a handsome man and he was cocky and you know, confidence is very attractive. So women love that. That's one of the things people love about Layla Ali too. Every man seems to just fall at her feet when they interview her. They can't even stay focused. So she's so cocky like her daddy and she's a beautiful woman too. It's like, oh my goodness. I aspire to have that level of confidence because man or woman, you can't help but be attracted to that, you know? But I love 
their cockiness, their arrogance, but I loved all that he's done for the community. He just hits him and Malcolm X. I love to hear them speak. I do. I really do. Very charismatic, very entertaining, hilarious. He, I could see him if, if he was young and born today on Twitter, he would be a troll. <laughs> His beefs with, um, Joe Frazier, oh my goodness, if there was Twitter with him and Joe, Cardi and Nikki would have nothing with him and Joe Frazier. And I think they would just be trolling each other, but Muhammad Ali would always be the one who'd win. You really know how to get under people's skin. And it's just funny to watch, it's hilarious. Do you ever get into the ring hating the man you're No, never, 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 no. Do you get in with anxiety or fear? I be, I'm nervous because of the talking that I do and I have to back it up. I think about people. <laughs> I'm on a hell of a spot. I'm on a heck of a spot. Can you imagine Blue Lewis whooping me? I'd have to, Frankly, I couldn't no. go back to America. <laughs> But comment below who else would you guys like for me to do videos on that is athletes you know i have an athlete playlist i'm building to do more on athletes so check that out also i've done flojo and layla ali now we have muhammad who else would you guys like me to add to the list and also don't forget to leave a fire emoji in the comments especially if you watched thus far you're a real one i love you guys so much thank you for tuning in until next time